Well done. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so tonight is our kickoff for our uh, missions conference, and I'm so glad you're here. We've got a great turnout, and we've got some good things in store for you um, tomorrow night as well, and Friday night, and on Saturday is the International Buffet. And I believe we've got at least six. Mrs. White, is it six or is it seven? One or the other, she says. Well, there you go. Uh, different than, than nations or countries of the world chosen. And um, I guess there's room for one or two more. So if you're interested in being part of that, you'll want to uh, put your name on, on the list in the hallway there, the International Buffet. Well... Let's um, open up our Bibles, please, tonight to the book of Philippians, and we're going to be in chapter 4, Philippians in chapter 4. Now, tonight, I want to speak on the subject of the benefits of a faith promise conference, the benefits of a faith promise conference, or another way we could word the title is, how can a faith promise missions conference help me as a Christian. Missions is uh, unfortunately uh, losing its popularity amongst many churches all around the world. The churches seem to be dropping their emphasis on missions and getting the gospel out there. And they're putting their emphasis more on themselves and uh, things that they can do. And the heartbeat of God has always been to take the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world. We just saw a wonderful biography on Hudson Taylor, one of the more famous missionaries, spent 56 years of his life trying to reach the dear people in China. And a tremendous man of faith and prayer as well. Uh, one day we're going to get to sit down with Hudson Taylor in China and uh, he'll be able to tell us in more depth and detail the ministry that uh, God had called him to. I'm sure there's so much that we don't know. Um, we are blessed as a church to support so many missionaries, but it just didn't happen. We just didn't wake up one day and all of a sudden we're supporting 78 missionaries. It wasn't like that at all. It all began years ago with one missionary. That's how it began. And then uh, I believe it was we took on three more after that. And then a couple of more after that, and a few more after that. And uh, that's, that's how it happened. And today, we're supporting so many missionaries, but 78 missionaries is a drop in the ocean compared to the need. There's 200 countries in the world. If we had one missionary for every country, we'd still need 200 missionaries just to have a representation in every country. You say, but pastor, why do we need that? And I answer you back, but dear people, the Lord requires it of us. He requires us to go into all of the world and preach the gospel. But you say, we're just so small. I know it, but God is so big. And it's not our power. It's his mighty power. And I believe if we keep depending on God's power, we're going to see greater things happen. And so we come to this subject, and I think it's a good subject to begin the conference with, is how can this conference, this Faith Promise Conference, Wednesday night, Thursday, Friday, Saturday in the afternoon, and on Sunday, that's the conference, and how is it that this conference can help us as Christians? And we're going to try and answer that tonight. First, let's have a word of prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can be here at church tonight in the beginning of this conference. And we ask you, Lord, to use the Holy Spirit to teach us biblical truth that would change us and increase our faith in your promises, increase our faith in, in you, Lord, your integrity and your desires. Please help us now this little while as we look at some important Bible verses. Some of these, I'm sure, will be very familiar to uh, many but there may be those here that have never seen these verses before. Lord, whether we're new at it or whether we're an old hand at it, use your scriptures tonight to make us even stronger and bless us together. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 
Well, I have a little story that I um, came up with a few years ago, and it helps to illustrate this idea of um, how the, the faith promise conference, the, the, the principles of faith promise can help us. And I've used this story a few years ago. I'm going to use it again tonight because I think that it's, it's a good illustration. It's only an illustration. The names mean nothing. They're made up names. The times and dates mean nothing. They're just made up. But it's to convey the idea, the principle. And the story is about two families. And uh, the one family, we're going to call them the Nooks family. N-O-O-K-S. And the second family, we're going to call them the Books family. B-O-O-K-S. The Nooks and the Books. Now, the one thing the Nooks and the Books had in common was that they were two beggarly families. Mom, dad, and a teenage son. And uh, three in each family. And each family, both the Nooks and the Books, made their livelihood by begging on the street. And generally, they could make enough money to afford the food for the day and some place to sleep at night. The next day, they had to do it all over again. And this is what they were used to, and this is what they knew. One day, as it happened, the nooks and the books managed to meet. Maybe they landed on the same street, and they met each other. And they got to know each other, and they shook hands, and where have you been? We've been working the east side. Where have you been? We've been working the west side. How's it going? Oh, about probably about as good as you, that sort of thing. And so uh, they got to know each other a little bit. And uh, then they, they started to, to realize they both shared a dream. Both the families, the nooks and the books, had a common dream. And that dream was to own their own house and maybe own their own car. Now, that's something that maybe many of us would just take for granted. But the nooks and the books were very poor people. And uh, they depended on begging every day just for their food and for a place to sleep. And so uh, as the days went on, um, the, both the nooks and the books, something happened with the books. As they got thinking about it, they thought, there's got to be a way that we could make our dream a reality, that we could maybe one day own our own home. And so the books figured out a key to their situation a key to their situation. And what they figured out was that they would try to find regular jobs rather than just begging. They would try to find regular jobs that would provide them a better and more reliable source of income. And so uh, this is what they did. And they began job hunting. And of course, at first, they just had nothing but closed doors. No one wanted to hire them, but they, they persisted and after a number of weeks, in fact, it was seven or eight weeks, finally, all three members of the Books family were able to secure employment. Now, it wasn't high-paying employment, but it was employment. And it was a guaranteed income for them. And they were very happy, and they rejoiced in that. And uh, when they shared their good news with the Nooks family, the Nooks family were happy for them, but they said, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're, we're fine the way we are. We, we like it. This is what we're used to. If that's what you want to do, more power to you. You know, have a, have a great life. And so that was the reception they got. Well, the, um, the Books family kept working at their job and uh, saving as much money as they could. And they were able to actually save up enough for a security deposit on a small two-bedroom apartment. Now, this would not be in downtown Vancouver, trust me. <laughs> They'd be saving for 20 years. But this was in another city. But it's my story. And so their key idea all of a sudden worked. They had enough for a down payment on a, uh, um, a little rental two-bedroom apartment. And they were able to... Uh, to get in there and to, uh, to start to live. They had a place they could call their own, come home to the same place every night. Uh, meanwhile, the uh, Nooks family just continued to beg and got enough money for the food and for uh, 
a place to sleep that night. Now, over the next 12 to 24 months, all three members of the Books family began discovering a second key. The first key, of course, was to, to help their situation, was to find regular income. And that would provide them some, some form of housing. And now they, they realize the second key to their situation. They figured that if they could somehow take some extra schooling on the side, they could upgrade their skills and they may be able to get better jobs. And so by saving some money slowly over that period of time, they were able to save up enough to be able to pay for some night classes. And indeed they upgraded their skills. And at the end of this 12 to 24 month period, all three of them actually found better paying jobs. They were now able to put aside more money. And in fact, another year or two down the road, they were able to save up just enough for a down payment on a very tiny place that they could call their own. And so they came to realizing their dream of uh, owning the house, along with the bank, of course, but to uh, owning their own place. And then they started working on a car. Now, the two keys that worked for them essentially was to um, get employment and then to improve on that employment. And those two keys seem to help them in their situation. Now we can see that the two keys to the financial blessings, employment and improvement of that employment, we can see that that works. And much the same way in a local church, the two keys to the blessings of God are a healthy faith promise missions program. That's important. It's important that every Bible believing gospel preaching church be involved with missions. Faith promise is in my opinion, the better way to do it. Some churches just take, you know, a percentage of their total income and they just shovel that into missions. God bless them. But I think it's better to do faith promise for a number of reasons. It gets us more involved. It gets us more personally involved. It helps get our hearts out to the mission field more than just taking an amount off the general and giving it to missions. I mean, that will help missions and there's no question about it. But I think the faith promise program that we use and literally thousands of other churches use, I think is the better way of doing it. I'm very pleased with the faith promise program, missions program that God's allowed us to have in the church. But the second key is to not stop there but to improve upon that. And as we improve upon the faith promise missions program, it results in more of the blessings of God. And I'm, I'm going to show that to you tonight. And so every year we try to host meetings just like this. Around this time of year, we try to host a faith promise missions conference. We invite missionaries to come in. They'll be here tomorrow night. And uh, we try and encourage all the Christians in the church to get on board and understand the value, the importance and the value of a healthy, growing Faith Promise Missions program. And so our plan here, right up front so that we all know it, our plan is to learn together the secrets of Faith Promise so that we can all get involved, so that we can all receive the blessings that God has for us. Now, how can a Faith Promise Missions conference help us as Christians. I believe there are two basic overall things that a promise, faith promise conference like this can do for us. Number one is it can give us instruction and understanding as to what it's all about. So we can get instruction and understanding. And number two, as we get involved, it releases God's blessings upon us. That is as true as I'm standing here tonight. This being the case, it means that the Faith Promise Conference becomes the most important time in the whole calendar year. It's actually more important than Christmas or Easter or our church birthday that we just came through. And we had a wonderful church birthday party, didn't we? We had a big attendance and we had lots of uh, great things happening that day. And it was, it was so exciting. But the Missions Conference tops that. It tops them all. 
because the missions conference deals with the very heartbeat of God. And God is happy for us to have a 20th church anniversary like we had. He's very happy for us. But what's even more important to God is getting the, his gospel around the world. Now we're talking the most important thing with God. And so in your Bible in Philippians, I'd like to direct your attention, please. And we're going to uh, look at a few verses. And we'll begin at verse 10. And keep your seats and follow along with me in your Bible as I read, starting at verse 10. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Notwithstanding, ye have well done that ye did communicate with my affliction. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica, ye sent once and again unto my necessity. Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And so these verses here help explain what we're talking about in greater detail. Now there's four basic things I'd like to point out to you tonight. Number one, when we get involved with faith promise, and let's, let's uh, uh, make sure that we all understand what we're talking about. Faith promise is where we spend time with God in prayer over a series of days. And we say, Lord, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to get involved? What do you want me to give to help to support missionaries? The giving of faith promise is not the same as tithing. Tithing is different. A tithe is 10% of your income. You give that to God, God will open the windows of heaven for you. The faith promise is above that. You don't take your tithe and put it into the faith promise, nor do you take your faith promise and put it in where your tithe should be. They're, these are two different areas of giving. And God blesses them accordingly. And so over a period of time, days, days, and you've been praying and you've been seeking God, God may lay on your heart to give a certain amount. Let's say God lays on your heart to give $25 a week. $25 a week. You say, well, what good could that do? What good that could do is to support one missionary. We support our missionaries at $100 a month. And so $25 a week means that we can take on the support of another missionary. But, be as it may, you've been praying about this, and so above your tithe, you give this $25 uh, a week uh, to the Lord. Maybe you want to give monthly, that's up to you. But you give this by faith. Now, on the basis of that, what happens? Well, number one, as you do it, it produces good works. Now look at verse 17, please. Paul writes here, he says, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Now, I know he talks about fruit. We'll get to that. But Paul, Paul told them that it was not for his benefit, not for his benefit alone, but for them as a church and individuals within the church. You see, uh, God has called us to good works. You say, how do we know that? We know that because Titus 3.8 says, This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. Also in Titus 3.14, And let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses. Now, good works are something that 
benefits God. That's the idea of good works. They ultimately benefit God. We're told in 2 Corinthians 5.10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in the body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So uh, your works are either good or bad. So if you're going to produce works, you might as well produce good works, because as a Christian, you're going to stand before Jesus Christ one day, and you'll have to give account. So this is very, very important. Uh, are 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 God's people, Christians, supposed to produce good works? And the answer is yes. Good works produce eternal rewards, but good works are things that benefit God. Now, the second thing here, um, hmm. actually, maybe before I get to that, I'll turn your attention to verse 14. Paul writes, notwithstanding ye have well done that ye did communicate with my affliction. This fits hand in glove with the idea of good works. Good works. Do you remember back in Matthew 25 where the Lord gave the parable of the, uh, the servants and um, he gave... Um, there was a certain Lord who gave a certain amount of money to one servant, a certain amount to another servant, and then one piece of money to a third one. You remember this story? And the Lord goes away to receive a kingdom. He comes back and he gets his servants together. And the first one says, Lord, your five has got five more. So you got 10 here. And his Lord said, well done, thou good and faithful servant. He said the same thing to the second servant. You remember that? But the third guy just went and hid his Lord's money in the ground, buried it in the dirt. Not a good idea. And he was reprimanded by his Lord. But the first two servants were told, well done, well done. And in verse 14, notwithstanding, ye have well done. How about that? When you get involved with faith promise, that is a good work that God looks upon and says, this is well done. It is well done. Our Lord Jesus, by the way, told us in Matthew 6, not to lay up treasures on earth. And that's the normal, natural human thing to do. It's just like little squirrels that gather all the nuts and put them all away. And that's what a lot of humans do. They gather all of the money they can and they store it all away. Not all of them. Some of them spend it like crazy. Some of them spend more than they have and they go deeply into debt. And then they worry and bite their fingernails. What am I going to do? How am I going to get out of debt? But a lot of people, what they like to do is to hang on to their money and store it all away. And the Lord Jesus said, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth. But he said, lay up treasures in heaven. Now, God rarely ever tells someone to go and liquidate all our assets and give it to Jesus and, you know, trust him. I really have never met anyone who had that uh, message from God. Normally, for, for all of us, we're to do things within reason. But the principle is not to lay up our treasures here on earth. Now, let's move on here. The second point I'd like to point out is that... Um, Being involved with faith promise not only produces good works, but it produces fruit. Now that's here in verse 17. He said, I desire fruit that may abound to your account. You say, well, what's the difference between fruit and good works? Good works are things that are beneficial to God. They benefit God. But fruit is something sweet and pleasant. And it's something sweet and pleasant to God. When you and I are involved with supporting his missionaries, his gospel preaching missionaries that are leaving the comforts of home and going halfway around the world with the gospel to try and help people get saved. When we help support those people, it's like something sweet, something desirable, something pleasant to God. He sees that and he's very pleased. Not only it does uh, faith promise produce good works, but it also produces good fruit, something that's very precious and sweet. In Proverbs 11.30, and we have part of that verse up here on the wall, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. In uh, John chapter 4, verse 35, our Lord Jesus talking to his disciples 
The woman at the well had just realized who he was and went off to speak to her townsfolk. And now Jesus says to his disciples, lift up your eyes and look on the fields for they are white already to harvest. So it's very important that we be involved somehow with the harvesting and the work of God. And again, I say that sadly, churches around the world are dropping their emphasis on missions. It's, we're learning that fewer and fewer men and women are becoming missionaries. We're learning that fewer and fewer of those many, many graduates, thousands upon thousands of graduates that come out of Bible colleges yearly, we're learning that fewer and fewer are applying for missionary service. Getting involved with faith promise produces four things. Number one, good works. Number two, it bears fruit. But number three, and this is the overall effect, point three is that it pleases God well. Look at verse 18. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you. Now remember that the church at Philippi had put together a missionary offering for the missionary Paul, and they sent it by the hands of Epaphroditus. And so this monetary gift came to the Apostle Paul, and look what he refers to it as. He says, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. What Paul is telling us here is that a missions-minded, missions-active church pleases God well and therefore glorifies God. That's why this week of meetings is the most important. We do try to glorify God in everything we do, but the most glory we can ever give to God is as it relates to getting the gospel around the world. This is the way we glorify God more than anything else all through the year. This also shows us that when a church supports God called, God sent missionaries, they're supporting special representatives of God on earth. In 2 Corinthians 5.20, it says, Now we are ambassadors for Christ. That's who those missionaries are. They are ambassadors, sent ones on behalf of Jesus Christ. The financial support of such a missionary is therefore a gift to God himself. And that pleases God. When you support missions, you're not just putting money in a bag or in a plate or giving it to a fund. You are giving it to Almighty God. That money goes to support precious heroes of the faith, men and women that take the gospel where we cannot get to. And this is the all done through the local church. It's a local church context. And now I want you to observe the special connection between faith promise and pleasing God. Look at verse 18 once again. He calls it an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. The mission's giving is well-pleasing to God. Now I want you to keep that phrase in mind, well-pleasing to God. Your mission's giving is well-pleasing to God. You got those words? Because I want you to turn now to the left to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. And I want you to see something I think is amazing. Ephesians 5. Now in Philippians 4.18, we were told that mission's giving is well-pleasing to God. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, watch this, and hath given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. A sweet-smelling savor. You go back to Philippians 4.18, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. You see the parallel? There's an interesting parallel between what Christ did on the cross to what you and I do every time we support missionaries. Faith promise support of missionaries and Christ's 
sacrifice of himself on the cross have something in common. They're all working to the glory and honor of God by getting people saved. They're connected. Christ's death on the cross, our support of gospel preaching missionaries, our faith promise, are connected together. Those two are connected and both of them are well-pleasing to God. Both of them are a sweet smell to God. Boy, that to me is exciting. I believe that uh, that should motivate every Christian to want to be involved with supporting gospel preaching missionaries. Giving to missions fills heaven with its strong aroma and fragrance and it perpetuates the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It perpetuates the truth, the knowledge, the power of sins forgiven, the deliverance from hell, the gift of eternal life with Jesus Christ. It pleases the Father well. And by simply looking at those two passages, we can see that there's a definite connection between what our Savior did on the cross and what you and I can do for him by supporting gospel preaching missionaries. It's well pleasing to God, a sweet smell. It's exciting if you ask me. Now this brings us to the last point that I want you to see in chapter four of Philippians. And I want you to be careful with this because it's been so badly bandied and abused. But point four is that it blesses the church people materially. It blesses us materially. And again, I exercise strong caution here. Please don't think this is a way to become rich quick. This is not a way to become rich and wealthy. But verse 19 is given as a promise of God. It's given as a safety net, as a guarantee for the uh, missions-minded, missions-active local church and the participating members who get on the bandwagon and are involved with faith promise. They are the ones that have claimed to verse 19. And I'd like you to read that verse out loud together with me now, please. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. This verse is telling us that God will release to us material blessings and spiritual blessings as we get on the bandwagon and we obey God and start supporting the missionaries. And you and I get involved with faith promise. God gives us this safety net because many Christians are wondering, well, how can I do that? Because I don't make a big income. I'm not independently wealthy. I can't afford to retire why, at the rate I'm going, I'll never be able to retire, some Christians would say. How can I possibly give? I'm asked to give my tithe and now to, to give a faith promise? What will happen to me? I, will I go broke? And God is assuring us, no, you won't. You will not go broke at all. God is saying, I will make sure of it. I will make sure that all of your needs are met. You do it my way and you leave the mathematics to me. You and me, when we do our math, we say, let's see now, one plus one is two, two subtract one is one. When God gets involved with the mathematics, one plus one could equal 10. You say, how is that? It's because God has ways of making the other eight appear out of nowhere. And all of a sudden we got 10. And 10 subtract one, you might end up with 11. When God gets involved with the mathematics... Don't try to understand it or explain it because it's the working of Almighty God. We've seen it for years. This promise here is not given to all Christians generally. It's given to only those Christians that are involved in supporting the gospel preaching missionary. That's the context that we have here. Now, I think that at this point, we should take a look at Malachi the last book of the Old Testament, I'd like you to turn there, please. The book of Malachi, because I believe that this passage in Malachi chapter 3 goes hand in hand with what we read there in Philippians chapter 4.
Now in Malachi chapter 3, look at verse 8. God asks a question, will a man rob God? And most people would say, no, of course not. How can we rob God? God goes on to answer the question, yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Where, wherein have we robbed thee? And God answers the question, in tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. And then God gives the, the answer to the problem. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now, herewith saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Maybe you've heard some various arguments from various people saying, well, this doesn't apply to the church. It applies only to Israel. And oh, we don't live under law. We live under grace and things. But I'm telling you the same God who promised Philippians chapter 4 is the same God who promised Malachi chapter 3. Now, tithes are a way in which you honor deity. It's always been that way. And did you know that tithing began before the law? The law began with Moses, but tithing began with Abraham 400 years before the law. The way that people honored deity was to tithe. That's how they did it. I've been tithing now since before I got saved. It's almost 45 years that I've been tithing. And I've never seen God fail me. Never. Oh, I've had times where I've been, you know, pretty slim Jim and had to pull my belt buckle in a, a notch or something, but never went over the cliff. Never. More times than not, way more times than not, I've had more than what I've needed. I've never stopped tithing. I started tithing. Tithing is what got me into a gospel preaching church where I got saved. So tithing is good. You can't tell me tithing's not good. Tithing is what led me to get saved. And I've been tithing ever since. I, I don't have millions of dollars, but over the last 45 years of tithing, if you do the math, that's a lot I've been able to give to the Lord, isn't it? For me, and I'm just, just a tiny little peon in the whole big uh, scheme of things. But I've been able to do something for God over the 45 years. Anyone can. Anybody can. You move one, one rock a day, eventually you're going to move a mountain. One rock a day. Eventually that mountain will be moved. Tithing is not how much you have. Tithing has to do with your faith. That's what it is. And by the way, when it says here to bring all the tithes into the storehouse, uh, in 1 Timothy 3, 5, the church is called the house of God. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17, the church is referred to as a temple. The promise is the same from the very same God. That's why during faith promise, we always give you an opportunity. Let's see if I have that here. I do. Here are the faith promise cards that we handed out last Sunday. We're going to hand them out again this Sunday. This Sunday will be our opportunity to use them. We haven't used them yet. The idea between, uh, with the faith promise is between you and God. Just like it's between me and God. There's no place to put your name on these. You fill in the amount here on the big portion is what you keep. And then you duplicate that on the little portion is what you hand in. We take all these little cards, add it all up, and now we can know what we can do for the next 12 months in the way of missions and supporting missionaries. But one of the little boxes on here, it's called the tithing challenge. And the idea is, it's a, we challenge you. If you've not been tithing, try it. Just by faith, you know, check that off. Accept the tithing challenge and just see what God will do for you. That's the tithing challenge. So we leave that in there for you. Now, in Philippians 4.19, we see this promise. But there's something I want you to see here, and it's very important. God is wealthy. I think you'd agree, wouldn't you? No? Yes? Yeah. W would you agree God is wealthier than you? Yeah. All right. Okay. We got 100% agreement on that one. I agree. He's fabulously wealthy. I want you to see his promise. It's worded very carefully. 
Verse 19, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And what I want you to see is that um, the supply house with God as the owner, God's worth, God's net inventory, if you will, it's not out of, but it's according to. And that's a key difference. When the promise says, My God shall supply all your need according to his riches. It doesn't say, my God shall supply all your need out of his riches. Because if it said out of, it would indicate that once he took some of his riches and gave it to you, he's that much poorer. And if he keeps doing that, eventually the riches diminish, diminish, diminish. Now that's you and I, that's us. We go home to our our cupboards of food and we take out some food to give to someone. Well, we're that much less, aren't we? But imagine if you had a food cupboard where you could open it and take out an armful of groceries and give it to someone and you look back and not one grocery is missing. It's just as full as when you open the cupboard. And so here's another worthy cause, a needy soul. You take out a big armful of groceries and you give it to that needy one. You turn back. The cupboard is just as jam-packed full as when you first opened it. That's God's storehouse and riches. God gives to us not out of, but according to. And his riches, according to his riches, they're infinite. They have no end. You can't see the end of his cupboards. You, you can't dig down to the depths. You can't climb up to the heights. He owns it all. He owns far, far more than what's even in this world. His riches are so incredibly extreme. And that's why God has no problem in making you this carte blanche promise. Whatever your needs are, I can meet those needs. If you get on the bandwagon, get part of Faith promise, I will be your safety net. I will make sure that you have all of your needs met. And why wouldn't God? Because it brings God honor and glory, not just when you supply the the money to support missions, but it brings God tremendous glory when miracles start happening in your life. And you start now receiving things that you didn't, ask for or you didn't know existed and God is meeting your needs meeting your needs all of your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus ah oh, it's amazing you know in old testament times in egypt pharaoh was the king pharaoh owned all of the riches and all of the storehouse of riches but joseph was the superintendent Joseph was the one with the key. Pharaoh gave the authority of dispersal to Joseph. And when Joseph's brothers came with their empty sacks, Joseph made sure they went home with full sacks. Jesus, your Savior, is the one in charge of all of the riches of eternal God. He has the key. And when you get on the bandwagon and you help support the heroes of the faith, the missionaries, with your faith promise, Jesus now will take special note of that and he will become your safety net. He will make sure you have all of your needs supplied. Isn't that wonderful? Boy, I tell you, you don't get a better offer than that. God tells us, absolutely, Hey, listen, did you know that 1% of the world's population controls over 50% of the world's wealth? Did you know that? 1% of the world's population controls over 50% of the world's wealth. But listen to this. God controls that 1%. How about that? When you have time, read the book of Haggai, chapter 2, verse 8. God comes right out and he tells you, The silver is mine. The gold is mine. All of the world's wealth. It's estimated to be somewhere in the neighborhood of $300 trillion U.S. The world's wealth. God owns every penny of it. 
it's easy for him just to move a little your way. And he will do that for those Christians that are glorifying him by supporting his God-called missionaries. That's why every year our church needs to be reminded of these basic guidelines. That's why we do it every year. So as to carry out our faith promise and to try to increase it. The two keys, remember, start a good faith promise program and then improve upon that faith promise program. It keeps the faucet of God's material, financial and spiritual blessings open all year long. And so there are four things faith promise will do for each one of us. But there's one more basic guideline I want you to see and then we're done. And if you would turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I'd like you to see this. These verses in chapter 8 of 2 Corinthians are in the context of supporting um, gospel preaching missionaries. Verse 1, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. This is the grace of giving. How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep, what's that next word? Poverty. These people were not wealthy. They were not wealthy. But look what they did. Abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, and, look at the next three words, beyond their power. They were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And here's the key I want you to see. And this is what needs to happen in in our church and in our hearts. And this they did, not as we'd hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. Paul wasn't hoping this much, but he, he got it. it they, did, they did beyond what he was expecting, beyond what they had hoped. They gave themselves to the Lord. We might call this the Lordship of Jesus Christ in our hearts and lives. You say, you know, I I, I did that last year. I was here. I did that last year. And that's good. But this is a new conference. This is a new year. And this is something actually, folks, that we need to do every day. One of the smartest things that you can do tomorrow morning is to lay on your face before the Lord and say, Lord, here's the morning sacrifice. Me, I give myself to you, Lord. Whatever you want for my life today, I'll be it. I'll do it. Wherever you want me to go, I'll go. Whatever you want me to experience, I'll experience. Be it joy or sorrow, health or pain, wealth or poverty, whatever you want. You know, sometimes, I'll be honest with you folks, sometimes in order for God to really make Christ inside of us, He has to crush us a little. He has to do a little of that crushing. And that's not something that we all get excited about. No one likes to be chastened. No one likes to be crushed. But in so doing, he's able to get rid of the worldliness, the selfishness, the poor me attitude, or the hey, I'm big stuff attitude. He's able to get rid of that through the crushing. And then the beauty of Jesus can be built in us. Say, why would we want that? Why would we ever want the beauty of Jesus in us, if it costs crushing. Why? It's because, beloved, we cash in with the other wonderful things of God. God is so full of desire to give good gifts to his children. Wonderful gifts. The greatest life you'll ever, ever live on this planet is a life where you're just intimate with God. But in order for that to happen, you need to partake of his holiness. In order for that to happen... We need to get rid of the worldliness. That's where the crushing can come in. And like you, I've experienced crushing too. We don't know what tomorrow might hold. Maybe some of us will be crushed in little areas and others crushed in other areas. We don't know. But it doesn't matter. God knows and he's the one who's tailor-making all this for us. 
The best thing we could ever do is give ourselves to God constantly. And that's what we need to do here. We need to re-surrender, re-yield, resubmit our lives to the Lord's will for our part in His faith promise program this year. And so verse 5 appears to be like the secret of proper giving to God's work. Otherwise, we're prone to be selfish. Otherwise, we're prone to see everything as belonging to us. Otherwise, we're tempted to think, oh, I can't afford to do this, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep this. I'm not going to give any more. I'm not going to give anything at all. The remedy for all of these problems is first to give ourselves to the Lord and give God yourself and give, give God everything you possess. That's the smartest thing you can do. Acknowledge His Lordship in your life. And understand, by the way, that God has already given you everything that you have. You've gotten it from God anyhow. It was a gift from Him. And the best way that you can show Him your love and devotion is to humble yourself right now and to lay yourself at His disposal. And if you will do this, God will be pleased to accept it. Say, how do you know? Because of Romans 12, 1 to 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. What's the rest of it say? Holy, acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service. That means it can be reasoned out. Yeah, this makes sense. It's logical. That's why I know God will accept us. He'll accept you if you offer yourself to Him. And that's what I want to encourage you to do now. That's our next step. Our very next step where we put one foot in front of ourselves. It's to give ourselves to the Lord, to acknowledge His Lordship. And I'd like to encourage you to do it. You can come to the altar and do it. You can do it right there. But let's first stand for prayer. Should we do this now? Stand to our feet for a word of prayer.